So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call on Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. I'm Trisha Gordon. Uh, I'm facilitating today's session and um, we are delighted to have Michael Green to demo the Sakai 21 dark mode for us <coughs> in just a little bit. But before we launch into that, let's see if we have any announcements. Um, hi, everybody. So just a quick reminder about the virtual conference coming up next month. So the date is November 12th for the virtual conference. That's a Thursday. And um, the schedule and registration will, will both be open this week. So I'm hoping to get the schedule posted um, later today, at least tentatively. Um, we might have a couple of you know, minor changes to the schedule, but at least to give you an idea of, of what's on tap for that day. And, um, and registration should also be live um, before tomorrow. So, um, so you can check the virtual conference site. I put the link there in the etherpad um, to, uh, to check out registration. It's going to be a reduced fee, I can tell you that much. Um, we've got some sponsors covering um, a portion of the registration fee so because we know that a lot of people have very limited professional development funds this year um, so it's only five dollars per person to register um, so thank you to learning experiences on Longsite for helping to sponsor the remainder of the the registration cost mm -hmm. um, yeah so um, mm -hmm. you can look for that uh, later this week awesome thanks Wilma mm -hmm. <laughs> And Josh, I see you're posting a couple of things. You want to just go on the mic and, and describe what you're posting in the announcements? Sure. So um, I, I sent out an email to the Sakai users list and the dev list a few weeks back, and several of you contributed. Uh, the idea was to start aggregating contacts for third-party vendors of ed tech tools that might integrate with Sakai. So thinking about this longer term game in which we open proactive lines of communication with, with, these, with these vendors, uh, we reach out to them and work with them. We provide them with expertise when they need it, uh, all in the long-term interest of trying to keep Sakai talk at top of mind for them and trying to increase both the quality and the quantity of, of integrations. So the, uh, the first effort uh, in this longer-term initiative is, uh, is going to be on Thursday, October 22nd. There's going to be a meeting uh, that will be a, a technical briefing on the current state of LTI in Sakai that's going to be led by Dr. Chuck. So uh, I'm going to send out uh, invitations to these third-party vendors. Uh, thank you all again for the contact information that you provided. I'm going to send that out uh, either late this week or early next. Um, and so the, this will be the, the beginning of our charm offensive with the vendors. So um, I just want to let you know that that's moving forward and that we're, we're, we're starting to work on this. Uh, one of the, I mentioned this at the core team yesterday, and one of the questions was, do we want community uh, involvement at the meeting? And the answer was, you know, great for community members to come. What we want to do is we want not to be using this first meeting to to ask hard questions about what's wrong with, you know, or what's what, you know, what the problem is with this integration or that integration. I want to. You know, I, I want to build these relationships and then those questions, once we you know, are in solid relationships with some of these vendors, will be easier to ask and those problems will be easier to solve. So anyway, mostly I just wanted to let you guys know that's where that's going. If, uh, if any of you would, would like to attend and listen, you're more than welcome to do that. <clears throat> so Josh, just out of curiosity, what if some of the problems with integrations are on the Sakai side? Well, that'll be hard for the vendors to solve, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that... Is there, if, well, is there any effort going to be done to, to look at that, to, to how we're doing things that might be complicating it for vendors? So the, I mean, I guess I have two responses to that. I mean, so one is the intent here is to, be vendor focused, um, but I think that you're raising something that we need to think about also, you know, in, under the heading of keeping our house in order so that, you know, stuff works the way we intend for it to. Um, is there is there a specific instance that you had in mind? Because I, I could see 
uh, you know, some of these questions about, uh, you know, maybe infrastructural changes that are more friendly to integrations possibly being uh, right. part of the roadmap conversations yeah. this fall. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, nothing specific, but... Um, I think there's one, uh, like um, LTI tools like Gradescope, for instance, there's that uh, Gradebook REST thing, right, that blocks... Right. The ability to modify an item that's sent over, say, from Gradescope into the Gradebook. But I think that's being addressed now in later versions of Sakai, isn't it? I think, well, I know Gradescope is working on, their focus right now is to support LTI 1.3, and they are hopeful that that will solve the problem somehow. I'm not sure how, but um, with the uh, zero grade issue. I mean, an, an early... Uh, an early goal of talking about the current state of LTI 1.3 in Sakai is to start providing vendors with the information that they need to to leverage this open standard to try and solve some of these problems. Um, you know, but you know, it's like anything else, right? I mean, so there are lots of reasons why integrations aren't what we would want them to be, and this is not a one size fits all solution. This is only a piece. So I definitely think that we ought to work as a community to figure out what those areas are where, you know, maybe some, you know, some better attention to our own plumber's pipes, you know, might be helpful. And then we yeah. can figure out how to do that. And so who is invited to this October 22nd meeting? Is it just internal right now? Um, so or are vendors invited? So it's, it's the, the intent is to invite vendors. Oh, okay. Um, so that that's that's the primary audience. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me let me let me dig out the list because uh, let's see. And do we know um, which vendors have have RSVP'd that they'll be there? Um, well, hypothesis said they would come. So I mean, having not sent out the invitation yet, it's kind of hard. Oh, to we know. haven't sent it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so no. So there's a there's there's a link to the list that I just put in the in the chat, and. Um, Interesting. The, the 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 title has been edited, um, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> um, but that's all right. Um, okay. So probably I should change the, uh, the the permissions on this a little bit. But so these you've seen this list before. A lot of you guys have uh, added information, contact information to this list. So. This is, you know, I, I want to uh, email all of the people on this list. Um, and okay. if there are obvious ones that are missing, there's still time to fix that. So I, I definitely welcome, you know, any suggestions that people have even at this late date. Cool. Thank you. And and so when this invitation goes out to vendors, will the rest of the community get an invitation as well, or how? So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk in you know I want to make sure that the working groups know that they're that this meeting is going on. Um, you know I want I want people to be aware. Um, I think you know so I think that the plan is not to send an email out to the Sakai users list, for example, right? Because mm -hmm. you know we definitely want this to we we want in the interest of building relationships with the vendors, I kind of want to focus on them for a bit. Um, you know, I want to, I want it not to be a meeting where they, you know, have a, you know, a crowd of thousands gathering around. Yeah. You know, I kind of want it to be someplace where, where they all feel comfortable in the longer term interest of, you know, being, you know, interested in working with us more intensively. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, so it's, it's kind of a delicate line, right? So, you know, what I would say is that anyone who wants to come and hang out, you know, in that context is more than welcome. How do we know how to join? Oh, I mean, I'm I'm glad to put, uh, you know, the the event information in the core team meeting, and you know, so kind of continue okay. to talk about it in this way once I actually set yeah. up the, the event. So, okay. um, anyway, so so glad to do that. I mean, I, I'm I'm shying away from a really broad invitation. Okay. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean it needs to stay that way forever, but. I want I want to land the plane successfully on the first meeting. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. So here's here's what I'll do. I actually have the meeting scheduled, so I'll put the Zoom link in the Etherpad uh, in the interest of full disclosure. 
Okay. And then people can, uh, you know, make their, their best choices. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Josh. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks to you guys for helping work on this. Any other announcements before we dive into our main event? All right, then, Michael, let's turn it over to you for a demo of the Sakai 21 dark mode. Right. I think you have everything you need to. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, coming through, right? Yeah. Mm hmm. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about dark mode and theming overall um, for 21 and beyond because there's been some significant changes and so i'd like to just kind of get a feel for the room how many uh, if you would in the chat how many people uh have a role in in doing the sakai theme for your institution curious how many people either do the theme themselves or how, how do you handle theming at your institution do you have somebody else on your team that does it uh do you ask Longsight to do it do you not do anything um Just to get a quick sense of who, <laughs> yeah, I bet I bet you do, Marty. Um, I know some of the names here, so I'll try to keep this um, as non-technical as I can because I'm not seeing that there's a bunch of uh, people who do the do the themes. Um, so there's kind of. Um, in res in regards to dark mode, dark, you know, uh, well, let me step back further. So I will I'll go all the way back to here. Um, hopefully, some of you have seen a version of this. Um, if you have never seen this or something that looks kind of like this before, I would love for you to post that in the chat. I'm just curious how how many how well this has gotten around. So this is a, a mock up of a, a new portal and tool design that the uh, Sakai UI steering committee has been working on for the past uh, six months or so. And uh, not not finalized, but we've done several rounds. And, uh, and this is also not for 21, but this is kind of the genesis of the project is last year. Terry, uh, you're looking at a new version, a new UI for Sakai that has uh, an assignments Tool. This is assignments list, right? And and um, and so this um, came out of the Sakai Virtual Conference last year, where I did a presentation on what a Slack-like Sakai would look like. That got some traction, and then we formed this steering committee to say, well, let, let's rethink UI and Sakai. Continue the efforts uh, of Sean and Jolie with the Switch project. And and then um, some folks threw in. Well, what about dark mode? And 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 so there was a lot of UI conversations happening around January, for uh, at at Sakai Camp. And so this is one of the things that we've been looking at. Is this is a a, a you know a Sakai 22 uh, scheduled you know UI. And then so we thought, well, that's for 22. What could we get in for 21? Could we get dark mode in for 21? And so. I've been doing some some work on that, and in order to support dark mode, we had to make some significant changes to the way that the themes work with Sakai technically. And this um, this is a change from uh, something called SAS variables to uh, CSS custom properties, and and so there's been a lot of change under the hood to swap out those uh, one of those for the other. But what that allows us to do is is to switch um, between themes. And so I'm going to go ahead. And actually, I'm going to uh, log in as instructor here. Just to, oh, I actually can't type. And and so this is on my local host. Um, and then this has got the new dashboard already enabled. And uh, so what I'm going to do, you may have already seen this on Nightly if you've taken a look. Uh, and this. Uh, I would just want to preface everything that uh, this is still a work in progress. Um, dark mode is most likely not going to be enabled for 21.0. Uh, it'll be in there. It'll it's already behind a property that you can turn it on, turn it off. Uh, and I, I've 
pretty sure we're going to set that property to off by default for 21.0. If we make more progress than we expect, then, then we may turn it on for 21.0. But right now, the plan is maybe 21.1, 21.2. It's, it's on by, by default. And then there'll be a version of this toggle. And if you've clicked this, you've, you've seen a, probably a much worse version of this on, uh, on Nightly because it, it still needs a lot of work. Uh, just be upfront about that. So we're, we're hoping to allow folks to have the ability to switch between themes. We're also adding in the capability to uh, look at what the user's operating system preference is. That's a very new uh, method. So if you have uh, on your computer or your phone set to dark mode, the browser can actually read that and then it'll automatically set it to dark mode by default. Um, and, and so switching out from SAS variables to CSS custom properties or CSS variables allows us to do this switching in a very efficient way. Let's be at the discretion. Uh, so Terry, this, this is a user preference. Right. This is not something that I set to dark mode. Now, I guess you as the system, you, you could set dark mode to be your default theme as a system. But right now, the, the light mode is the is the is the default system theme. And um, and, and yes, we are uh, testing for accessibility. Um, and so this is an and this is. Um, so I mean, th this is dark mode. There's a ton of work. There's some there's some hard problems to solve here with the way that Sakai does UI um, and some of the libraries we use, and we're we're having some discussions around how to best do that. Um, for example, we'll just pop in here to a a table real quick. The the way tables are are used. Uh, is is a challenge I'm still working on. So uh, I've taken care of the majority of the easy stuff, the portal uh, and whatnot. But now we're working through all the specific things that weren't really easy to fix. And so this this is why I say there's there's still a long way to go here. But we have kind of the infrastructure in place to to enable this for for a future release. And and in addition to that, I, I'd like to also talk about how we're trying to make it easier for institutions to work on this. So the goal here, I don't, I don't know if you've ever looked at the file that you have to set to do your institution's theme. It's, a, it's several hundred lines long, and you have to set a lot of variables. And what I did with part of this work was try to abstract it out to about 15 variables. So this is a new version of that file. Um, then trying to document it very well. And so one thing we can uh, do is just set your primary colors. Set your kind of like is active, is selected colors. Set your background colors. And then there's a couple other ones that you may not even need to change. But so we're really talking like nine colors. If you set nine colors, the entire app should should essentially be done theming for most institutions. And that's not going to be a guarantee. So what I just wanted to really quickly do was enable that theme. Um, and then refresh. And so if you were a red institution, uh, it'd be you know, it, as easy as that. Right now, you have to set a lot of these things specifically. We don't um, abstract them as, as nicely as I would like. So, uh, so now we can. And so if I just do really quickly change all of my reds to purples, which is 10, 10 things I'm changing, save that. And hopefully now we have a purpley theme. And you can see, you know, for the most part, you add a logo change in here. And, and hopefully you should be done. And so particularly for 21 out of the box, 21.0, we're assuming light theme is, is the theme that everyone's going to go with. Most institutions are not going to enable dark theme out of the box. Um, and then from there, we want to make it as easy as possible to just kind of keep the look of Sakai, but theme it to your institution's brand really, really easily. And so that's kind of um, that's what's going on there. So I see there's some stuff in the chat too. Uh, I will uh, I will answer some questions if people want to unmute to ask some questions. Uh, we can. We are. Um, Adam has a question about whether. The idea is that there would only be one theme to select either 
light or dark? Uh, so currently, the, the, the idea is to just do a, a toggle. But this is the potential beginnings of, of something really interesting, right? You know, another mode that's coming in is a high contrast mode. I'm seeing that more and more often. You're seeing sites that let users pick their theme. I don't know if you go to Twitter. Twitter, I can like change my theme dark mode, but then all my like highlight colors, I could change them to green instead of blue. And so we could have user specific themes that, you know, keep some institutional branding, but also give users the power to do more than just dark light mode. Yes, we, we have the infrastructure in place to enable that, but not that's not the plan for 21 maybe in maybe in 22 or 23 we could get there this is really cool can looks like uh, terry go lightly wants to know can you specify the color code or do you need to use the standard color yeah that's a great question so there's there's a new way to enable um this and so what i'm going to actually do is we'll just do uh we'll just call this like my school uh, and i have no clue what this color is going to be but we'll just pick like 150 and we'll drop the saturation a little bit and do this so i'm just going to pick a random color i'm going to save this and this is a, a new theme we've added that allows you to to create a palette for your school's brand so if you have a single color like there's a Duke blue, right? Um, I can put Duke blue in here. I could call it Duke. And then I could come in here and actually do things like this, where I change, uh, we're gonna find that and we're gonna replace that with my school. And so now I would use this and hopefully, I actually didn't practice this part of the demo, should have. And, uh, Yeah, so here right now I'm at a green school. So what this did is it, it generated 10 shades and tints of this green for me. I put in like the medium uh, green and then it generated all these light versions and then darker versions when necessary to create a nice theme overall. And I didn't have to go think about that. Um, and there is actually a set of, I want to talk about accessibility just a little bit. Um, there is a really cool, I don't need that right now. Um, there is a set, see it generates all of these colors for you. These are all the different things uh, that it generates, but it also generates There is what I'm looking for. It generates a set of classes that uh, prohibit you from uh, making inaccessible choices, right? And so I was hoping to show those. I don't know where I've lost those at here. Um, let me come back here and I'll show you what I mean. So it creates a set of classes that are what I use to generate this. And you could see how there's, you know, at some point each of these switches between, and it's not just black and white, it's kind of hard to tell, but each of these uh, this this font here is actually uh, this this background color. It's a very very light blue, and so there's four options as in this palette. That color function generates the ten shades of teal here, but it also generates these ten classes that says, well, if I use this class, then it'll set the background color to the really dark teal, and it'll and if and then it'll set the the, the text color to either a really light version of that teal or white or black or a really dark version of that teal, whichever one is accessible. And and then um, if I do this, you can uh, oh, to get this out of the way. You can see there's some new stuff in Chrome. Uh, right above my mouse, it says accessibility contrast AA 10.44. So there's a there's a cap on these. And if and if you know in this really dark gold, a black color would not have met it met the color contrast standards. So it moves on to the next option in the list and it selects one that it does meet that. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think there's still a little bit of refinement to exposing how people could use that, but that's going to be really powerful. I think we could like make use of that inside a CK editor, right? And say, oh, you want to add some flair to your, 
you know, lessons or your content, well, here's a way that we can guarantee your content is going to meet um, color accessibility. So I'm really excited about that. But um, it's, uh, it's it's right now it still needs someone who understands like CSS to, to, to use it. We don't have it like in the UI to pick from somewhere. Super cool. Um, yeah, any other questions or thoughts? We have a lot of excitement around this in the chat. Um, Back to dark mode. No, no further questions at the moment. Um, yeah, this is oh, really great. And so for the um, CK editor uh, work, obviously this work needs to go in for initially first and um, are there plans to work on that or is that just an idea that's out there? I, th I think it's just an idea at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like a very logical one to me yeah. though. You know, once we kind of get a feel for how we could use this, um, mm -hmm. these CSS classes are, are, are something I wanted to put in place for the rest of the UI work I was doing for the app. And, and then it was naturally like, oh, well, maybe people would actually like to use these. And so yeah. we, we haven't even really had those conversations yet. Yeah, gotcha. It's awesome. Would the CK editor palette be limited to, uh, I don't know, Terry, um, it, you know, there, these, there are some out of the box colors, right? There's a um, out of the box Sakai uh, because it's it's an app that needs a robust color palette comes with all of these a, a series of grays blues light blues teals golds greens orange purples and reds so out of the box unless someone goes in and manually finds those and deletes them we can make those we can expose those uh, it would be an extra step to say oh well let me find all your unique school colors and like suck those into ck editor that may be possible but uh, i'm a little out of my depth there i'm not sure how we would do that Yeah, that is. But I could see that would be totally something people would want to do, right? Like yeah. I would, I would want to, mm -hmm. I would want to use the school's colors for there. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. Very cool. Oh, Michael, this is exciting work. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's been I've been enjoying working on it. And it's coming together just a little. Still a lot left to do before it's really polished. So. Do you uh, you mentioned an app that you're working on? Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about that? I don't know if you've already done that in a previous meeting, but I I would like to hear a little bit more about that. An app I'm working on. Did, I thought you just minute mentioned an app. No. I don't think so. Oh, okay, I misunderstood. I misspoke you. if I did. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um. Oh, this is great. Any other questions, folks, for Michael or comments or feedback for him? Feel free to enable your mic. I see Sean Foster is typing a message. Oh, I, I just, I guess I meant the, the app of Sakai itself. So oh, Sakai, oh, okay. Sakai as the app could. <laughs> <laughs> the web app could, could make Thank use you, of these things more. Yeah. I thought I heard that word, but anyway, yeah. Big kudos to you, Michael. Absolutely. This is so awesome. And I love, I love this accessibility, the built-in accessibility checking. That is amazing. I'm wondering um, about uh, the globalism sort of thing. When you're talking about making these, uh, the color changes and the choices, what level are you speaking about? Are you speaking about the institutional admin level? Or are you speaking about the course level? That somebody would say, okay, we're going to go with this green stuff. You know what I'm saying? I think so. Um, so the way we've built it now is at the institutional level or at the system level. Um, okay. Well, and that's not exactly accurate. I mean, I don't know how much, you know, you can have many skins on your right. Sakai installation. Yeah. So it's at the skin level. I mean, I could have a Duke green, a Duke purple, a Duke orange. Okay. I could create all those and change the things as necessary. And then an individual site could be set to Duke green instead of Duke blue. Um, but out of the box, it's meant to be, you know, Sakai comes with the Morpheus skin and this is at that level. 
so the oh. developer in English 101 can't go pick their own color palette. Not it's, currently, no. That's that's okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> There's, there could be too much freedom in that. Yeah. You never know. We do have a Duke Orange, though. There is an official Duke Orange. <laughs> I have an issue with Duke Orange. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. thanks uh, for your time, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. If you have questions or <laughs> thoughts or more you know, concerns or whatever, feel free to shoot me an email, Slack, tweet, whatever. So uh, are you working with others on this, or have you been doing this mostly on your own, Michael? Uh, Sean and Sean Foster and I have been working on this pretty heavily, um, mm -hmm. and then the UI steering committee that meets every other Thursday morning okay. uh, is also kind of given a lot of input, as well as the core call. I mean, I've had several big challenges that I've needed to to run through on the core call. And so, if any of us wanted to be more engaged, we could attend those UI meetings on Thursday mornings too. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Great. Um, great. Well, thank you again so much. This is really exciting work. Yeah, thanks. Come, coming soon to a Sakai near you. That's right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Tiffany mentions in the chat, no matter how accessible you try to make it, allowing the freedom of editing your own HTML and CSS will allow every inaccessible combination to be used. <laughs> True. Okay. We're going to move on. We have a few JIRAs in the queue that we can spend a little time on. And um, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at those. So it uh, looks like Tiffany added, uh, and I'll paste the link in the chat, um, <clears throat> this ticket is about allowing users greater control over attachments they upload to various tools. So let's see if I can go open that and share it in the screen. I, so you want to talk about that, Tiffany? I thought we already talked about this last meeting. Oh, OK. Well, it's on the agenda for today. So we can move on. I don't know. I. I think we were talking about it and people wanted to continue the conversation. Is that correct, Wilma? Yeah, um, we decided we picked it up at the very end of the call. We only had, I think, maybe five or 10 minutes left. And we realized very quickly it was somewhat complicated. So we thought we would table it and come back to it later. OK, Doki, let me try to. Do we want to do that now? Uh, well, I can't pay very much attention to it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't okay. know if you guys want to pick it up. Um, yeah, well, we can leave it on there. We'll come back to it when we have Tiffany's attention. Cause... OK, sounds good. Let's see. Uh, looks like the next two, there's only one that isn't a Tiffany Jira on the list. <laughs> Let's go to that one uh, that Adam put on the list. It's 44232, and I'll paste the link into chat. And this has to do with exceptions for assignments. So this actually, there's sort of a similar thing about allowing a late submission, um, first late submission in assignments. Um, it's a little bit different, but uh, it might be good to link that JIRA. Sorry, Tiffany, I was busy share, trying to share my screen, and um, so I missed your point there. Apologies. It's similar to SEC 40813, which should be linked. OK. Do you want to do that? Or I guess I might need to log in here in order to do that myself. It's going to take me a couple minutes. I have some support. Okay. Email to... I, I can log in and link it. Thank you, because for some reason I am not logged in and I have a sharing thing in my way to log in. So. No worries. 
Thank you, Adam. So I also can't update the label that we've reviewed this. But as you're um, doing that, Adam, do you want to walk us through what the issue is here? That I think the issue is fairly straightforward. We have uh, an entity that we call Merge Courses, where an instructor might teach multiple sections simultaneously from the same site. And they wanted an assignment to be assigned to two different sections, but have different due dates and times for those respective sections. When I realized that, uh, that there was no way effectively to do that within the assignments UI, it led me to think that um, there's now a deficiency in assignments compared to Samago, where Samago allows for exceptions on a student or a group level, and assignments seems not to. So the 44232 is sort of a cattle call to find out if there's interest in adding exceptions for assignments. And then also, as I looked at the UI, I realized that uh, historically, uh, tests and quizzes had been organized around draft assessments and published assessments, and the UI was really complex. So uh, we collapsed some of the sections of the UI into roll-ups or turndowns, if you will. So there's also a link from 44232 to uh, 44231 in the comments where um, potentially assignments should have its settings coalesced under turndowns. So that is a really horrible UI in tests and quizzes and needs to be fixed there too and completely redone. So I really don't think that should be done. That's fine. Yeah, and actually we've, we've been looking at both um, the assignment setup area and the quiz setup area and we're going to tackle, you know, other um, sort of gnarly workflows is what we've been calling them. Um, but the idea is that <clears throat> they have some good elements and lots of bad elements. <laughs> and we'd like to try to cherry pick the good ones and maybe come up with a consistent UI across all of those tools that is friendlier and easier for people to manage. Yeah. So, so, so we don't get off track though. The um, JIRA for the TNL group primarily to consider is whether or not exceptions should be allowed in assignments. It seems to me like a no-brainer. Yeah, it does seem like a no-brainer. It seems like that should be something that you can do. If I, I would agree. If I assign papers to my class and one of my students comes down with COVID-19, but I want a single gradebook item in the gradebook, um, should I allow them to submit the same assignment with an exception and potentially have Turnitin apply, for instance, for their submission? They should be able to do that without creating a separate assignment or a separate workflow. Yeah. And Laura Sierra has a great suggestion to join the UX call immediately following this one to talk more about all of these workflows and how to improve them. So I also agree that uh, there should be an exceptions here. Um, I'm actually coming from Moodle campus a little while back, which does have this. Um, one thing to be a little wary of with this is at least with Moodle, um, with resubmissions also being in the interface, it can be a little confusing, uh, the difference between a resubmission and an exception um, for an instructor. So it's just something that would need to be thought through there. Well, I'm not going to file another JIRA, but I'll mention that we already have that uh, UI and workflow issue in tests and quizzes, because if you limit submissions in tests and quizzes to one and then add an exception, the exception changes um, date and time limit restrictions, but it does not change the submission restriction. The submission restriction takes precedent. So if you wanted a student to be able to do a retake, you have to change the master number of submissions for No, you. no, you don't. You have to you have to allow them a retake. Ah, sorry. Misspoke. But, Generally, but, I, I find it easier to change the number of submissions, but I get it. Yeah, I mean, that's not what you would want to do if it's after the due date, but before the late submission date. But that's entirely separate issue. Um, I think there are a number of problems with assignments that will make this more complex than assignments and tests and quizzes. We have the peer review and we have the 
um, their peer, excuse me, peer grading, peer assessment, whatever it's called. And we have the group assignment, both of which will have additional parameters and problems associated with this. And this will not be possible to do for a, um, uh, a peer assessment assignment. So I think it needs to be um, thought through very carefully uh, of how to set this up and how to do it in the UI and how to make it work for all the different assignment types, if that's even possible. Uh, and if not possible, how to uh, make it clear to the instructor, you know, when it works and, and how it works. Totally fair. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, even if you do give a retake and give a, an exception on a quiz, the late submission date, at least with the main settings, also has to be later than, than that exception. The, the late, yeah, the submission date, for, so there's actually a bug right now where if you have a multiple submissions test and allow, a retake and a late submission date, then you can't do the retake if you still had numbers of submissions greater than one. Um, but th that's a particular bug. Um, but you should be able to extend the date in the time exception for that particular student um, and um, and allow them to retake. So what I'm I'm getting at more is if say the late submission is seven days from now, the normal period has passed. Um, one student has been given a retake and a new open period, but another student who never took it at all could log in and submit to the quiz the first time because the late submission date is still there. No, uh, you should. So, so you should change the exception date for that student. You'll need to extend the exception date for that particular student for the retake. I mean, they should be able to take it late you know with a retake um as a, you know the retake counter is separate from the actual quiz counter so it operates slightly differently Laura, Sarah um, posts in the chat that she's wondering about another option and not as tidy as this fix, but uh, to duplicate the assignment for each group and associate each group's assignment with the single grade item in the grade book. No, we do not want to do that again because we had that and it caused instructors to overwrite grades for students from one assignment to the other. It never worked. So I just commented, as you probably see in the JIRA, that we agree pretty much across the board that we do want to allow exceptions, but we need to figure out how to do it um, along with all of the other batches that have been mentioned. Anything else on this issue before we move on? I, I don't know if we... I don't know, Tiffany, if you have any more time to look at any of your other JIRAs that you posted. And if not, um, we might be done. Well, I'd, I'd like to take a look at them, but right now I have some stuff to deal with. So Okay, that's fine. No problem at all. Yes, Laura says, it sounds like it worked, but allowed instructors to make mistakes too easily. Yeah, that's the way it sounds. Well, it, it didn't. It actually didn't because rather than allowing the instructor to put in, you know, say null grades for five students in one assignment and then go to another assignment and enter the grades for those five students, the nulls in the second assignment would overwrite the grades from the first assignment. And so then, you know, you'd still have <laughs> some students with no grades. Well, I'm wondering it, well, like Adam was talking about, um, so these are different groups of students. So you release the assignment 
to group, you know, one version of the assignment goes only to group one. So you'll only see submissions for group one. You'll only grade group one within group one's assignment. Group two is an entirely different assignment with different students attached to it, but you grade group two within group two's assignment. But those two assignments go back to a single grade item in the grade book. So they'll never see students from group one in the group two assignment. They'll never see students from group two in the group one assignment. They'll grade them independently in those two different assignments, but those assignments feed back to a single column in the grade book by association. So that wouldn't work because if the student is not in the group whose assignment is going to the grade book, then they wouldn't be able to see it at all in the grade book. Um, but the, the thing is that when they when you could associate multiple assignments to a grade book item, it didn't matter who was assigned to take it or not. Uh, it, it simply overwrote all of the grades in whichever assignment you last graded in. So, so you're saying, Tiffany, that if a student A received a grade because grade because they were in group one and student B was in group two and got graded to that grade book item from assignments, then the grade for student A would be overwritten with a zero? Would be overwritten with a null because okay. in, in the second assignment graded, they had a null grade. So then the second release of a null grade, grade overwrote the, the existing grade. That's what, what happened. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is that intentional behavior within assignments? Because I know that multiple forums can be associated with a single grade item. No, they cannot. No forums can be associated with a grade item. Forums does not associate, send, or do anything itself with grades. Forums just provides a window into the gradebook, gradebook items, so you can actually grade any gradebook item at all uh, that you desire from forums because it's atomic. It's, ma it's simply making a portal into the grade book. It doesn't store its own information regarding grading. Precisely. It's, okay. it's just a window into the grade book. So assignments, tests and quizzes, uh, when you see those little locked grade book items that they are capable of sending, those are actually coming from the grading services of those tools. Um, and they're, they're having their own internal storage of the grades. Forums itself has no grading at all. It's it's just providing a window, uh, you know, through the looking glass into the gradebook. So you'll keep overwriting an existing grade from a forum if you keep feeding into that one grade item. You're right. just overwriting it every time you put another grade in. You're not adding to it. You're just overwriting it. Exactly. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Forums. Yeah, some of the confusion about that with tools having their own grade handling um, was to be addressed in the centralized grading service, which mm. was partially implemented, but had not completely built out to all the tools. So that's still in development. Um, we, we got a portion of it done, um, but it's still kind of all the hooks in all the different places have yet to be um, put in place. What but eventually, yeah, eventually it'll be kind of one, one grade management yeah. service across all tools. So different tools aren't storing their own grades. There's only one definitive grade. What is the schedule for that, Wilma? Do you know? It's on the roadmap. Um, I, I don't, it obviously didn't make it in for 21. So I, I hmm. think it's in for 22 in the plan. Um, but those you know, plans always shift. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's definitely in the works. Wow, that that is yeah, can't wait for that. That'll be a huge boon. <laughs> Laura, I like your comment. Um, Great. Well, thank you, guys. I think then we are at the end of the agenda, unless there are other comments or um, if anybody else has a Jerry you want to take a quick look at, we could do that. Um, put it in the chat for us or something. Um, but otherwise, uh, we can be adjourned since we don't have, Tiffany doesn't have time to talk about the other Jira's on our list. I'll just move them to next time. 
Adam, did you get what you wanted uh, about for this particular JIRA? Absolutely. Okay. And I think you're still going to link to that other JIRA that we that was mentioned. Already done if you do a refresh. Oh, okay, great. Um, I, I think you all could talk about 34456. Uh, that was the one I mostly was interested in, uh, showing Samago feedback in lessons when a quiz is linked in lessons. That's a sort of long-standing JIRA that um, that has not been dealt with, and uh, I think it's a lot more important now that more people are uh, teaching online. All right, let's see. Let me switch to sharing this JIRA. 34456. Yeah, that's right. All right. And so this has to do with being able to see feedback when Samago is embedded in lessons. Yeah, yeah. if they want to hide the lessons tool, or excuse me, if they want to hide the tests and quizzes tool uh, right. and, and link to the quizzes, there's no way for the students to see the feedback uh, without making tests and quizzes visible. This is a really, really old JIRA. I don't think anybody is, yeah, nobody's working on it. Um, a lot of comments have been made in the past. What were you looking for today with this? Just um, that somebody look at it, you know, I mean, mainly that, that we get it more paid attention to and on the roadmap because it's not and it's it's been of interest for many many years and um you know people are complaining about it so obviously the workaround is not to hide tests and quizzes that's right um but you know people want to clean if people want to clean up that tool menu which is good um and get it out of there uh, then it would be nice to offer them, you know, something similar to assignments where you click on the link to the assignment and it shows you the feedback, you know, from the link. But similarly have a, when you click on the link to the test, you know, if it's already completed, you'd have the submission listing there and then the ability to click on the feedback link. So this is currently, um, it's open. It's assigned to the core team, which really means it's not assigned. Um, I don't know how we we get this moved up on anybody's list at this point. Anybody have a recommendation? I suppose we could vote on it if you haven't voted do that um add some more comments to the bottom if you have anything to add but voting i suppose would be um a good way refile the request for a better number <laughs> terry well you looked at it and said oh this is a really old request so it must not have value you know, oh, that's not what I said. No, but. no, that's not what you said. But that's kind of the the message that I put on that. So maybe we need a four, a, a four number instead of a three number. So they think it's more current. Because <laughs> if it hasn't been addressed in this long, then does it still need to be addressed? Yeah. How about voting? I um, did. Okay. Well, I'm just speaking to the group. Yeah. Large. Um, and uh, watching the issue to see if there's any movement. I think there are people on the uh, call who might also be on the core team who could, um, I don't know, does the core team take a look at votes on issues to determine whether or not it needs attention? Does anybody know? 
Not with any regularity. <laughs> Um, if there's one that's come up or maybe a couple that have come up and, and they're looking at it anyway, they might look at the number of votes, but I don't uh -huh. think that we systematically review the vote numbers. Okay. So how can we get this on the core team agenda to look at it? I, I can take it to the core team. I can okay. Mention it. Wonderful. Thank you, Wilma. That's helpful. Because it does look like there is some uh, renewed interest in addressing this. See, see what we can do. Awesome. Thanks, Tiffany and everybody. So we have um, our next meeting is on October 21st. And Marty, who mentioned a little while ago that he came from a Moodle school is going to share some Moodle features for inspiration. And I think that's wonderful, Marty. I'm excited to see that. But we also have some open sessions in November. Now, when is the um, Sakai virtual conference? The virtual um, conference is the 12th, which is a Thursday. So it will okay. just fall well, the same day as, as teaching and learning. Okay. Great. So we don't have any conflicts there. Um, so yeah, if you guys have things you want to talk about, uh, we can always do Jiropaloozas, of course, because we always have plenty of those to look at. Um, so, but if you have things, uh, if anybody knows of things to share, to get feedback on, um, that kind of thing, please, you can let me know or Charles Bristow or Wilma, we'll get it on the agenda. Um, you can just either Slack chat us or um, into the teaching and learning channel or send us an email. <laughs> Martin says he was hoping Michael Green would bomb today so his demo looked better. <laughs> I'm sure your demo will be fine. Uh, and uh, so looking forward to seeing you guys next time. And you have a whole minute of of time to claim before your next meetings. Join the UX call if you want to talk about workflows, which is next. Thanks everybody, and we'll talk next time.